off the cuff today with the whole world's attention on Ukraine, Russia, and Europe, a continent that so many of us had forgotten. Uh, we have the foremost voice, the foremost intellectual speaking about the strategic issues arising out of this crisis in Europe, whose introduction begins with former Prime Minister of Finland, but a scholar, a professor, professor and director of this School of Transnational Governance in Florence, um, and somebody who at a young age, while he describes himself as a sports nut, has been Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, European Affairs Minister, and Defense Minister of Finland, has also been in meetings with Putin. So that, that is a big box to check uh, on your CV these days. Alexander Stubb, we say in India, but you say Stubb. What's the correct way to pronounce your name? Uh, Stubb probably is closer. So it's closer to Tube than to Tub. And we've never met, but I have to also tell you that I'm very happy to have at least one prime minister in the former prime minister of the world. I'm on first name terms with. So, Alex, uh, welcome to After Cuff. This is a freewheeling conversation. Uh, there are a lot of people curious in India about what's going on as they are elsewhere. There is also the Indian position, which is, you can call it nuanced or you can call it cynical or whatever you want, uh, but you live next to trouble. So first of all, you are doing this series of lectures and I, I, I heard the first one, it's just beautiful 16 minutes. And you talk about the three mistakes that the human beings made. If I remember correctly, you said that we, we over-rationalize the past, right? Yep. So let me not repeat. You tell me the three points. Sure. Oh, I think, you know, what we usually do is we over-rationalize the past. So we look for examples from the past and think that they can easily be juxtaposed to today. Uh, secondly, we over-dramatize the present, which, of course, from a Finnish or European perspective at the moment with the war in Ukraine, is not an over-dramatization, but uh, the situation is serious. And then thirdly, when we do these two things, over-rationalize the past and underestimate uh, the, and, and, and over-dramatize the, the, the present, we underestimate the future. So yeah. this is kind of a human tendency. It's, it's quite normal for all of us, really. And apply that, apply that test to the Ukrainian situation now. How are we over-rationalizing the past? How are we over-dramatizing the present and how are we underestimating the future? Well, I think the over-rationalization comes quite often from links to various examples in history. So in a lot of the international media interviews that I've been given over the past few weeks, uh, there's been a lot of talk about Finlandization as a solution for uh, Ukraine or neutrality as a solution uh, for Ukraine. Uh, but obviously, you know, we are in the middle of a war uh, and it's very difficult to draw any kind of examples. I guess you can say that it's similar to the winter war that Finland fought with the Soviet Union uh, from 1939 to 1940, which lasted 105 days. A little bit closer to home, I guess, uh, for you guys. You could say that, you know, war in, in, in Korea was a little bit similar. Uh, or we could go to, to Afghanistan and say that, you know, there were similarities there. But to be honest, every case is its independent case. And in that sense, over-rationalization is a bit different. These were proxy wars. Yes. They were proxy wars. And it, it's difficult to define, you know, whether it's a proxy war or, or not at the moment. But, but it's a real war. It's a hot war. It's not a cold war uh, anymore. Then over-dramatizing the present, it's something that we often do in the moment. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's very understandable. It's very natural. And of course, when you are in the middle of a war, uh, things are very uh, dramatic. But when you are in the middle of it, I think it's very important to start thinking about the future. And, and I say this in a sense that, you know, during World War I, there were movements already during the war to think about a new global order afterwards. World War II, same thing. Um, after the Cold War, you know, immediate reaction. Uh, and I think we need to do the same now. And, and what I keep on telling my European friends here uh, is to, to say that we have to understand that this is not only about Russia versus the West. And by the West, in this case, I mean Europe and the United States. This is more about the global world order and its future. The way in which we set up the world order 
after World War II was very much about the so-called Western victors, uh, you know, in Yalta and elsewhere. And I think the frustration that the rest of the world looking at us at the moment is to say that, listen, let's start talking about the future, but this is really your war at the moment. Yeah, but the, what were the Western victors also included the Soviet Union and China at that point. And that's yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, but at the same time, you know, what I want to say, the Soviet Union was also an authoritarian and totalitarian regime. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the reasons that the narrative that Putin is telling his people at the moment uh, is working is that they've never dealt with their past the way in which, say, Germany did. In other words, Stalin uh, was a hideous, hideous murderer. He slaughtered 25 million of his own in one way or another, and Russia has never dealt with this. So, you know, th th there are different perceptions of, 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 of power and of, of victory from World War II. But what I'm trying to say is that we have to understand that we are not anymore living in a Western-dominated world. There are huge players in this world, like China, like India, who are looking to find their place into the rooms where the big decisions in this world are, are taken. I mean, the example that I always give is the UN Security Council. Why do we have the UK, France, uh, the US, Russia, and China there? Where is India? You know, wh where is the rest of the world? So, you know, we have to understand that the, the, the order is not what it used to be. So you see, uh, as you look at the future, uh, you see this world order definitely changing. Yeah, definitely. And I, it usually happens is in, in, in big sort of junctions uh, of world affairs. This is the over-rationalization. So it happened, say, 1917, 1918. It happened uh, 1944, 1945. And it happened 1989, 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed. And, and now I think we should be looking at not anymore the post-Cold War order, but a way in which we uh, deal with multipolarity in a multilateral framework. And that means that power has to be redivided. I personally think that we're moving more towards uh, what I call, would call regional power. So, you know, you have this sort of nexus of power in, in Asia. You have a nexus of power in Europe. You have a nexus of power in America. You might have a nexus of power in Africa and bring these big, big players together. But we can't have the old world order as it stands, you know, the WTO, uh, 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 the IMF, the World Bank, NATO, the European Union, uh, they were all created in a world that doesn't exist anymore. Well, uh, let me bring attention to India for a moment, uh, since you talked about a changing world order. And I will just read you a laundry list of people who've come visiting in India and who are coming in to visit the next few days. So... Uh, so we had uh, March 19, Fumio Keshida in Delhi. March 20, there was a but, uh, uh, March 20, Austrian foreign minister. Austrian foreign minister. Uh, He's a good friend of mine, Alexander yes. Schallenberg. Schallenberg. Yes. Ma March 21, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison had a virtual summit with Narendra Modi. Uh, March 22, US Under Secretary of State uh, Victoria Newland. March 23, Greek yeah. foreign Minister and Nikos Dendias, March 24, Oman, for, Oman Foreign Minister, March 25, Chinese Foreign Minister, March 28, EU Special Rep for Indo Pacific, then Mexican Foreign Minister, then March 31, UK Foreign Secretary, uh, she's in town today, and then Deputy NSA of the US, the Deep Singh, the sanctions man, and April 2, Sher Bahadur Duba, and tomorrow we see Mr. Lavrov. So, what does it say about what might be the new emerging order? I mean, do people have time to time to while away in 40 degrees temperature in Delhi? Uh, apart from Delhi being a beautiful place, uh, I think this is very much about trying to win over the hearts and minds of India, right? So, you know, you can see all the different players with different types of representation coming into town to prepare the future. And I guess, you know, the message from China is that you are important to us. The message from Europe is you're important to us. The message from the UK is you're important to us. And uh, the message from Russia is that 
well, could you please help us? So, you know, there's, a, there's this sort of frenzy of activity, diplomatic and activity. And this is what you see, you know, when there is a sort of a power vacuum that emerges and when there's a feeling that the global order is changing, then it's a lot about, you know, in which direction is the second largest country in the world, India, going to lead. Uh, and that's why I think there is a frenzy of activity in your country, and rightly so. I'd be doing exactly the same thing if I was still foreign minister as I was in 2008 during the war in Georgia, I'd be flying to Delhi as well, as I actually did, I think, in 2010. Yes, and in 2008, I remember you were also you were also party to settling the Georgian issue, at least for the yeah. next the conflict. Yeah. No, that was a big thing, obviously. I mean, I had been foreign minister for four months and the war in Georgia broke out. Um, I was chairman of the OSC, which comes sort of as a task annually uh, for the foreign minister of the country, which is holding the presidency. Uh, and of course, we have the 1,340 kilometers of border with, with Russia. So it was a tough situation. Went in there to Belize together with Foreign Minister Bernard Kushner, Kushner of France, uh, brokered a five, six point uh, ceasefire agreement in five days, took it over to Moscow, discussed it with Lavrov, and then handed it over to President Sarkozy to finish it off with uh, President actually Medvedev at the time uh, and Putin. So you know, interesting times then for a young foreign minister, but of course the war in Georgia, it's much bigger, it's much smaller than the war in Ukraine. I mean, the stakes were simply lower and we were able uh, to, to get the ceasefire quite quickly. So just as a footnote, uh, Bernard Kushner, who name, whose name you just mentioned, the former uh, foreign minister of France, then your counterpart, he's also featured uh, on a similar conversation with me uh, in the past. Okay, very good. Very good. Yes, as, uh, as foreign minister. Now, uh, that you described, that was the Russian formula of sending quote unquote peacekeepers. What's happening in Ukraine is nothing like that. What's happening no. in Ukraine is more like what they did in Grozny. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we thought, and you know, obviously Finns uh, have a tendency to analyze Russia very closely. I mean, we always say that our security is based on two things history and, uh, and and geography. And we can't do much of, for our geography, but we can try to sort of tilt history in different types of uh, directions. So we thought that Russia would do the usual script. Number one, send troops close by. Number two, have exercises with those troops. Number three, uh, start making claims and false information about the uh, territorial sovereignty of a particular region. Number four, try to intimidate the counterpart to to attack and react, and failing that, declare uh, and recognize the independence of the regions uh, in Georgia was Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Then you send in the peacekeeping uh, troops, but this time around they weren't peacekeepers; they were war makers, uh, and and that's where we got it wrong. I thought we would be creating uh, a new frozen conflict, uh, but the Russians thought differently. They wanted to take over Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, now. Uh... I have to apologize to uh, your Dutch counterparts because I forgot in the long list to mention the fact that the Dutch NSA is also in town today. There you go. There, there you go. And that's not because we are not being rude to the Dutch because they gave us a, they gave us such a hard time in hockey, field hockey, not ice hockey, uh, <laughs> which is your sport. Uh, but it's just a, such a flurry of visits. Now, uh, what did what does Putin want? Putin is not nuts. No, Putin, I mean, you have to understand his mindset. And, and I, I think one of the things that a lot of Western pundits especially have gotten wrong, they try to do psychoanalysis of him and, and claim that he's irrational or that he's lost his marbles uh, because of COVID isolation. That's not at all the case. I think he's a very rational, uh, analytical, shrewd and at times cold, but always very well prepared. Just because he doesn't seem rational from our perspective, doesn't make him irrational. So basically what he wants is, is, is three things. Uh, he wants to create a great Russia, which is based on three things, one language, one religion, and, and one leader. Uh, and, and he'll do everything in his power to do that. He's looking at his legacy. He wants to see his place in history as the unifier of Russia. He wants to make, to use a Trumpian term, make Russia great again. And that means taking over both Belarus uh, and then uh, Ukraine. 
so he wants to be seen next to Stalin, next to Peter the Great or Ivan the Terrible. Uh, and of course, uh, from his perspective, it's rational behavior. But the outcome, uh, I would say, diplomatically hasn't gone exactly as he expected. So you mentioned history and geography in this context, in Finland's context. But Russia's context, shall I also say culture? Because Russians have never had a culture of democracy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there are two aspects we have to think about here. One is the sort of cultural identity aspect. And the narrative of, of Russian history is very much of a country that's always isolated and that has been attacked from various directions uh, throughout its history. You know, Mongols, for example, you know, a lot of the words about suffering and, and deaths and things like that are actually with Mongolian roots. Uh, it's also felt that it was, uh, and rightly so, attacked by the Nazis during World War II. And now it feels like the West is trying to surround it or isolate it. Uh, and this is a narrative that they live with. So they have this feeling of we are alone and the rest of the world is out to get us. And with this comes also a Russian narrative that they have saved Europe. You know, they saved Europe from, uh, from, from uh, Napoleon and they saved Europe from Hitler. Now, I kind of disagree on the Hitler part, but, but I, I won't take issue with the Napoleon part. Uh, the, the bottom line here is that there is this narrative, strong national feeling as well. The second thing that, that you know, I call it the curse of natural resources, right? Russia is the biggest country in the world geographically, and it has probably the richest resources in the world. And that sometimes makes you, well... Uh, if not lazy, at least complacent, complacent to modernize. You're not forced to modernize because 50% of your state incomes comes from the, 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 the exports of, of, of oil and gas. And, and when you don't do that, you sort of drop behind in the cycle and, 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 and progress of history. So, and that's Russia has been always quite a lot behind the West. And of course, now, you know, Putin just took them back to the good old Soviet era, I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned one country, one language, one leader. That sounds very familiar with somebody else uh, that maybe your parents, our parents' generation knew in Europe. Yeah, well, the thing is, again, I come back to the over-rationalization of the past. And in that sense, it's always very difficult and, and dangerous even to make uh, comparisons because history and times are, are different. But, but there is always this sentiment, you know, of, of leaders who who pluck into the idea of nationalism and identity. And I've always said that it's much easier to live in a world of ideology, because with ideology, whether you come from the left or the right or the center, it's much easier to compromise, right? But with identity, it's more difficult, because then you are inherently compromising with yourself and who you are. You know, you have an identity. I, I don't know much about it. I know that you're Indian, and I've been following... Uh, some of your programs. So I have a picture of your identity. My identity is Finnish, European, and international. So it's very difficult for me to, 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 to sort of compromise on that. And playing with identity is always dangerous. Well, since you talked about your identity being Finnish, I'll take a question from one of our readers, one of our brilliant readers. His name is Sanjay Agrawal, and he's, he runs, he's founded a new bank, a very successful bank, AU Small Finance Bank. And he says, what do you think is the reason for Finland to be ranked number one on the happiness index? Quite <laughs> your thereabouts. What is your message to the world to say, stay happy and positive? And I, if I might add, in spite of the neighborhood you live in. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, I can say one thing tongue in cheek, which is to quote our uh, national poet, Eino Leino. He used to have a saying in one of his poems that if you're happy, hide it. Uh, and and, and I, I think Finns are pretty good at, you know, hiding, hiding happiness, not showing it. But when you're asked sort of discreetly, are you happy or not? Say, I am, but I'm not showing it to you. No, I, I think a lot of it is, 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 is basic needs. You know, we come to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Finns feel secure. Uh, we have a very strong welfare society. Uh, we have a good education system. Uh, we have very strong equality. We were actually the first country in the world to give women the right to vote and stand in elections around 1905, 1906. Uh, we've gone through difficult times in history in 1918 with a civil war. 
uh, with external meddling coming from the Bolsheviks and the Soviets, but then we united and unified in World War, War II. So a lot of it is linked, I think, to uh, you know, our, our economic well-being, our social equality, uh, these types of, of issues. We're also a very free country, and, and I think that helps in, in happiness a lot of times. You also have, Finland also has a very strong military. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's the it's the thing is it's, you know when you live in this neck of the woods, you you have to combine idealism and realism. Idealism is that you want to cooperate, uh, you know, even if you are living next to a, 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 a an imperialist aggressor like like Russia. You you, you want to sort of have the connections. But then realism says that even to have those connections, we need to have a strong military. Uh, so when the Cold War ended, you know, yes, we believed inherently in the end of history and liberal democracy and transformation and social market economy and globalization. But at the same time, with the wisdom of hindsight, we were realistic. You think we're not going to tone down our military expenditure. So we bought over 60 F-18s. Uh, we made our military very compatible with with NATO, we, we did joint exercises and the rest of it. And to be honest, we didn't say out loud, but it wasn't exactly that we were building up our military because of Sweden. <laughs> That's right. So as I understand also, for a very small population base, Finland can, God forbid, if trouble comes, Finland can feel a lot of well-trained armed people. Yeah. Larger army than most nations, particularly now that the US is going below 1 million. Yeah, I mean, we're a population of 5.5 million, and the figure that we often quote is that we have reserves of 900,000. Um, we have compulsory military service. I did my well. I'm a very proud Lance Corporal uh, in the reserves. Uh, and then, you know, we can we can provide a standing army pretty much immediately with mobilization of roughly 280,000, 300,000 men and women. So, and if you top that off with with uh, you know very strong uh, military material, both in the air, land, and sea, we do feel quite safe. And and you know, it's a bit like you know taking a, a fire insurance. Uh, we've always had that, and I think for the right reasons, especially now. Yeah, fire insurance is a good good concept. So for my Indian uh, Indian viewers, Lance Corporal is what we call in the Indian Army Lance Mac. Uh, now, Finlandization, I've been curious, and, and the truth is, I only read about Finlandization when the term began coming up in the context yeah. of... Uh, yeah. I mean, as a Finnish public figure and intellectual, uh, how do you see that as a prescription to a country like Ukraine? Mm. Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, the, the, the term popped up uh, from the annals of history, uh, from what I understand, actually, on a flight... Um, uh, with President Macron, some journalist who the journalist had asked him whether this is a solution. And allegedly he said, well, it's one of the options. And then, of course, all hell broke loose because for us, Finlandization is almost like an insult. It's a time in history that we want to forget. So it's a term that was created in 1966 by a German academic, uh, basically to say that, you know, you have to compromise your values in order to be able to survive to a to a big neighbor. And, and yes, I, I do agree that in the 1970s, we had to do that, but that doesn't make it right or comfortable. It made it a recipe of survival. So basically, we couldn't join the types of international institutions where we wanted to be. So the European Free Trade uh, Association, we had to have a special Finland EFTA agreement on that. Uh, we were not able to use full freedom of press, which we're number one in at the moment. Um, so we couldn't, for instance, say bad things about the Soviet Union. We couldn't even publish Alexander Solitsenichin's uh, uh, Gulag Archipelago. And the third thing that I found very problematic was that the Soviets were meddling with our internal politics. So we had a president who was in office for the better part of 24 years. And, you know, as much as you want to call yourself a democracy, if Moscow sort of dictates who is the president of Finland, then you're not really feeling comfortable about it. So therefore, I do not think that uh, Finlandization is any kind of a solution uh, for Ukraine. And I am not saying that Finland had a puppet government, certainly not, but I'm saying that it's an uncomfortable state of affairs. Well, if the Russians can decide whether you can publish or sell 
Golang Archipelago in Finland or not. That's a troublesome situation. Exactly. So, so how have the Ukrainians done so far in this war? Well, really well, I think, on, on many fronts. I mean, first of all, militarily, who would have thought that they can, you know, hold back? We're now over months into the conflict. I think week five, uh, week six starts today. Yeah. So, so you know, it, it's taken, I think, Western pundits and also Russia uh, by surprise. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, communication and information, I mean, hands down, the world champion is President Zelensky. So, you know, if you're looking who is the pariah of the world at the moment, it's Vladimir Putin. Who is the hero? It's Zelensky. Of course, it depends a little bit on the type of information that, you know, you see on your TV screens or get through social media. It's not that that clear cut, but they have done very well on that. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, they've been able through that to rally at least the West around them. I know, you know, a lot of people talk about the vote in, 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 in the UN, 141 states condemning uh, Russia, 35 abstaining, and then, you know, four, four states like you know, North Korea, Syria, Eritrea, and Belarus supporting yeah. Russia. It's now, a lot of West, yeah, a lot of Western pundits say that, oh, this was a great victory. Yes, to a certain extent, but keep in mind, keep in mind that roughly 50% of the world population represented in those 35 countries abstained, and there must be a reason for it. Uh, and that reason is, is the idea of Western dominance. Uh, and, and this is something that needs to be kept in the, in, in the mind of a lot of Westerners. So where, where do, how do you analyze where India is coming from? And do you have a, do you have a prescription for India? Well, I, I don't. And I'm also I'm always very hesitant, you know, to, to give advice or analyze uh, a region or country which I don't know well enough. I mean, I can only give examples of, of what we have done. But if I look at it as a political scientist and as a professor, we are clearly seeing that there are elements in world politics that matter a lot. Size and demo demography is one. Technology and development. Uh, is one. Uh, uh, global region, so Asia, is one. Uh, uh, history uh, and geography is one. Uh, so, you know, we are clearly seeing an, an India that emerges, you know, into the bigger power structures. Uh, and therefore, it's going to be interesting to, to see what India does. Of course, my preference is that, you know, it tilts towards uh, liberal democracy, social market economy, uh, and globalization, but it's very easy for me to say from a country with 5.5 million people and compare that to India, what, 1.3 billion? 1.38 right now, yes. There yeah. you go, there you go. So, so, you know, your eight is a little bit big for us at 0 0.55. <laughs> That's true, Mr. Vajpayee, a former prime minister, used to say in his public speeches whenever he reached out to China and Pakistan that, look, you can't choose your neighbors. So, so maybe that's what you're saying, that you can't choose yeah. your but you can make your history. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I come back to the point that, that every nation's security, and in many ways existence, is based on this sort of balance between history and, and geography. You can't do anything about the geography, uh, but you can change history. You can do the right moves. And I I would assume that that for India, apart from you know reaching out and becoming a global power, it's also about how you structure society society domestically and and how you're able to organize. And you know, for me to come with 5.5 million people to give advice to 1.38 billion, it just ain't gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. There is also there is also a defensiveness, and if I may say so, prickliness uh, in the. Indian debate that who are these guys lecturing us? So we have Balaji, exactly. Balaji PV, who's one of our subscribers, who says, why does EU and USA expect India to not to not buy oil from Russia when the EU gets so much oil from Russia, so much more than India? And what is the rationale in forcing India to take a stand with regards to trade with Russia when the Euro Europeans can't do it right now? Okay, let me give you a, a, a negative answer and a positive answer. The negative answer is that I, I think to frame an argument like that is quite often called whataboutism. And I understand that. 
you know, I, I, I don't have a problem with it. But, you know, when you say, what about what you are doing? But, but it, it's an argument also that the Russians are world champions. Are. <laughs> so we have to be careful with it. Now, my positive answer is that, you know, I understand what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. And one of the things I remember hearing at, at one of these big climate, climate conferences was, was, you know, an Indian minister, don't remember who it was and when it was, coming out and saying that, how do you have the audacity to tell us not to uh, improve our economy by using, uh, you know, fossil fuels when you have created all of your greatness on that? And there is this sort of, you know, understanding. And that's what I'm trying to say is that the West needs to understand that, you know, well, India, you know, there's a colonial past which doesn't exactly resonate well, correct? Uh, there, is a, there is a thinking that why did the West dominate? Why are you lecturing us now? And this is what the West has to understand, that, you know, things did not, you know, the Cold War ended, great, uh, you know, the, 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 but the truth is that this was not the end of history. It was actually the beginning of history. And now is when we should look at world power in a, in a new kind of a way and that means that, yes, we look at big states like India, but we also look at things that happen transnationally beyond uh, and below states. So there's a follow-up question, which our subscribers are all smart, much smarter than me, for sure. Uh, Prasanna Jayashankar, who says, following Ukraine's recent request for special security guarantees, even from non-NATO countries, will Finland to consider asking for the same instead of a full NATO membership? No, we're going to go into NATO, don't worry. So uh, basically, you know, Finns, Finns are quite quick and agile uh, in, in big sort of junctures of history. So in 1809, we became an autonomous part of Russia, moved over from Sweden. We maximized our autonomy. 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution, we immediately declared independence. Um, 1944, we survived peace. Uh, Finlandization was a part of it, I'm afraid. Uh, and then in 1989, 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we immediately joined the European Union. And now that Putin is uh, the great aggressor, there is absolutely no substitute for security guarantees. Yes, we have a great independent military. Yes, we have good bilateral agreements and different types of uh, security guarantees from the European Union, but we will join NATO. And I would argue that the application is uh, now weeks away, um, a few months at least. All right. So, because what is to stop this Putin or any Putin of the future from saying that, look, Finland was never a country, just as this one is saying Ukraine was never a country? This is one of the problems that Putin is, is breaking international law and those agreements that we actually set up uh, in the Helsinki Accords already in 19... 75 and then reinstated in 1992 in the what we call organization of security and cooperation in in Europe and they are about uh, territorial sovereignty and 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 they are about uh, national integrity and obviously Putin is violating that uh, and 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 in that sense you know I come back idealism and realism so somebody is being persistent Nito Joseph and I'm using uh, his lines to be persistent that put Forget that Finland has 5.5 million population. Put Finland in India's geography. How would you have dealt with this complex situation? Would you see as a threat, an opportunity, a bit of both? How would you steer the ship? Well, I think it's a balancing act for India to steer the ship. And, you know, on, on, and again, I say uh, I don't blame India for not leaning immediately to the West. Uh, at the same time, I don't blame India for, for having close discussions with everyone around the world. And it, it's a decision that you have to take yourselves. Um, I think we might be moving, and if I'm trying to sort of assess the new world order, it's going to be something that, you know, it, it could be in, in, in three poles, if you will. And I'm simplifying, over-rationalizing. Uh, you know, one pole is, is, is what I call the liberal world order. Uh, and, and to that, you would probably put in the traditional West, the European Union, the United States, you know, the Australia's, New Zealand's, Japan, South Korea's of this world. And obviously, I'd love to see India in that in that, that sort of group as well. On the other hand, you have uh, an authoritarian world order 
obviously, you know, led by China, uh, because all the illusions that China will become, uh, you know, Western style liberal democracy, we should just sort of ditch that and, and, and you know, uh, understand realities. And then it might have, you know, different types of, of coalitions in there. I actually think that Russia will be just a vassal state. Uh, you know, of, of China. And China will, of course, exploit the opportunity to go in uh, to the Russian economy at the moment. But remember, 30 years ago, they were the same size. Now China is over 10 times bigger economically than, than Russia. And then there will be this sort of third sphere of the order, which I don't know, you know, where it's going to lean or what it's going to do. So we're going to have a very complex world order, almost like a disorder. And then it's up to China to decide what place in that order it takes. It's interesting that you say Russia will be the vassal state of China, because if mm. that happens, China will have three, at least three nuclear weapons powers as its vassal states. That is North Korea, Pakistan and Russia. And who knows Iran, what happens with Iran tomorrow? Mm. So even those on the Western side who are planning strategy in the long run, they have to find a way of denying China this advantage. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's true. But I think we should probably think more in terms that the whole sort of idea of, of nuclear deterrence and a balance uh, and nuclear treaties is a little bit out of the window at the moment uh, yeah. because of Russian behavior. So, so we have to be very, very careful on that. At the same time, you know, uh, some world leaders might be uh, a little bit, how would I say, uh, driven by tox you know, masculine tox to toxic masculinity, uh, but but they're not suicidal. They're not suicidal. So. Uh now, once again, from our point of view in India, anything that's good for China is bad for India. Now and in the foreseeable future. Now, this kind of vassalization of Russia to China, I'm inventing a word, that's very bad for India. At the same time, India has immediate constraints, particularly on the military side and the economy side because of fuel prices. So how does, I mean, does India just then serendipitously float along in this situation? Because this is benefiting China. At the same time, India can't question the Russians, at least yeah. not publicly. Yeah, but here is where I come again. You know, I, I really cannot give advice to India. You know, it, it's not my place, uh, even as an academic. Uh, India has to take these decisions themselves, and you know what's best for India. I don't. So just on China, forget India. How does the democratic world now counter this rise of... Because Chinese are a bad advertisement for democracy. Chinese are a good advertisement for dictatorships. That's the last question. Uh, yeah, I think the West and especially liberal democracies have to wake up to a new reality. Uh, and that reality is one in which you cannot always choose to be cooperating only with countries or areas that are similar with you. And this is going to you know, require a lot of moral and ethical and political decisions. So it's not going to be an easy uh, new world order for the West either. Well, because it's not easy, we need fine minds yours, thinking and reflecting on it and talking about it. So I'm so grateful to you for your time. I know that you're much in demand. Thank you very much, Professor. I'll say Professor Alexander Stubb or Alex. I hope to feature you again on Off the Cuff. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you, Alex.